My guest today is Michael Shermer. He's an American science writer, historian of science, founder of the Skeptic Society, which they have 55,000 subscribers. He is a skeptic. And uh, he wrote a book called Why People Believe Weird Things. He's got tens of millions of views on YouTube. And he's famous for saying, at least for me, I've watched him uh, uh, quite a lot. He says, humans created God, not the other way around. We're going to find out what he really thinks about God at this phase of his life. Having said that, Michael, thank you for being a guest on Valuetainment. Oh, nice to see you, and uh, thanks for having me. I'm I'm greatly honored. Yes, uh, I'm looking. I'm, I'm really looking forward to this conversation, especially on how you went from being a believer to being where you are today, with the positions you have, your talk you gave on, whether it's TED talks, your debates with uh, not necessarily debate you have with Dennis Prager was more of a discussion, but you've had many different debates. The uh, speech you gave at Oxford was one that really stuck with me. So I'm really looking forward to getting into it. So, Michael, if you don't mind, uh, let's take a step back and walk us through how you got to the point you are today and the way you believe, how you went from believing in God and all of a sudden you don't believe in God anymore. Well, I wasn't raised religious. My parents were uh, non-religious, so I guess you'd say secular, but they weren't anti-religious. They weren't atheists. Or they weren't anything. And um, uh, but I got into the born again evangelical Christian movement in high school. So this was early 70s at Crescent Valley High, uh, near your arch rival. That's right. <laughs> you went to high school, and uh, a couple of my friends were really into this, the, the whole Christian movement. And uh, so I just kind of followed them, uh, as you do, you know, peer group influence and all that. And uh, but I took it pretty seriously. I I went to the Glendale Adventist and became born again. I went right up to the uh, to the table where you know the pastor called us all up and i'm like okay I'll, I'll give this a shot so i did it and then i went to pepperdine which is a church of christ school and and uh it was pretty conservative politically and religiously no dancing on campus you can't can't go in the girls dorms and vice versa and uh you know so uh, that, that was my uh, uh, shall we say indoctrination or experience and inculcation into the Christian religion, and I was pretty serious about it. I took courses in the Old Testament, the New Testament, the life of Jesus, the writings of C.S. Lewis, and so on. So I know the subject pretty well, and I believed it. I went door to door and to witness to people, and that's what you do as an evangelical. So and then I went to graduate school and slowly lost my religion, mainly because of several factors. One was uh, being ensconced in, in science and, and the empirical rational method of uh, determining what's uh, justified true justified true reliable knowledge and um and, and also this i began the study of kind of comparative world religions and i went through my joseph campbell stage of mythology and yep. all that stuff and and uh, it was clear that to me at the time that um all religions claim to have a solid purchase on the truth but they often contradict each other so how do you know which is the right one and the answer is you don't. <laughs> if you're an anthropologist from Mars uh, studying the world's religions, the er earthly religions, you wouldn't be able to know which is the correct one. And and unfortunately, you know, the creator of the universe wrote more than one holy book, and they don't always agree with each other. So which is the right holy book? And anyway, that and then the problem of evil, I felt uh, was never properly answered by religious people. That is why bad things happen to good people, you know, why things happen at all. And we put a moral valence on it good or evil why is that how does that happen and uh, and I, I never felt that the theist arguments made much sense to me so I just quietly gave it up I didn't announce anything I, I just just quit talking about it and I think much to the relief of, of my family because I was constantly witnessing you can you can imagine that the obnoxious kid at the at the family dinner table you know constantly talking about Jesus <laughs> yeah they were and they weren't religious again they weren't anti-religious but you know I, I know they they got sick of that so there was probably some relief on their part there got it can I ask you a question this is just I'm asking uh non-secular they're not atheists but they're not Christians they don't believe in a God they're more agnostic would you say your parents were agnostics themselves 
yeah, agnostic in the sense that uh, not not that they were searching and decided it was unknowable. It's just I think they didn't give it uh, much thought. <laughs> My parents weren't educated; they never went to college. Or anything. They were children of the Depression and and uh, World War II, so they you know it just it just never came up. I remember I, I remember they did drop me off at the Presbyterian Church in La La Cunada. More of an obligation, I think. Like, I think we're supposed to do this for our kids. <laughs> and I still, I still have my Bible uh, from that Presbyterian church. At any rate, but but it was it was not not a big deal in our household. You're, you're a statistician yourself, right? You said when you were studying yes, uh, uh, yeah. uh, sciences, you 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 like statistics. So when you look at why people convert or why people uh, eventually turn against God, right? That you know, uh, not necessarily turn against God, become become an uh, agnostic. Do you notice a trend of those in your situation? Not like you explained, you said, look, in the world, according to Oxford, you know, 84% of the world believes in some sort of a God. They're part of some sort of a religion. And you said 2 billion is Christians. I think you said 1 billion to 2 billion is Catholics. Then you have 1.1 billion, give or take, are Muslims. 850, I think you said Hindu. 400 million plus is Buddhism. Then you got a few hundred million million that are in their own religions. And then you got about 10,000 different religions. Even Christian, Christianity, I think you said, has 34,000 denominations, if I recall yeah, some of those statistics yeah, yeah. that you said. But walk me through, you know, if a person grows up in a Christian family, there's a high likelihood they're going to be a Christian. If a per- person grows in a LDS, they're going to be an LDS. If they, so your parents were agnostic. You became agnostic eventually. You're like you're following the lineage, like if there's some lineage there. But what do you say to people who go from non-believers to believers? What was the cause of that? And people who went from believers to non-believers, what's the cause of that? Is there a trend for yeah. both? Yeah, this is a, a big issue in uh, the psychology of religious studies. Uh, you know, there are journals and scholars that study this. And the basic take is that the number one predictor of anybody's religiosity is that of their parents. Now, of course, like in, in any social science issue, there's no one predictor that covers 100%. Lots of different factors. The second factor is peer group influence. Or if you have high conflict with your parents, that is, you don't get along with your parents, you don't like your parents, um, then you're less likely to be influenced by them. You might go the opposite direction. So highly religious parents in conflict with their children, their children grow up to be less religious and vice versa. So uh, and and then there's the influence as you get older, uh, you know, parental influence starts to wane in your early teens and and then peer groups take over and then late teens, early 20s, mentors teachers, mentors, uh, books that you read, you know, pop culture uh, also becomes an influence. So uh, after parental or family upbringing, then, then uh, 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 you know, peer group, that's what happened to me, becoming religious and then becoming non-religious. Well, I went to a secular graduate university, uh, Cal State Fullerton, uh, for a master's degree in experimental psych. And again, this was the 70s. There was no atheist movement. And no, no one talked about, you know, science and religion and atheism like it was a big thing. It just never came up. And so for me, I, I realized another factor of losing my religion was you don't have to be religious. These are good people, thoughtful people, moral people, and they're just not religious. Or maybe they are. Who knows? I mean, it just never came up. It was not important. And uh, so that made it kind of what's called social proof. It, you know, it's OK to not believe. Mm-hmm. Uh, because other people don't believe and, and yep. their lives are, are, are fine. So, that, you know, that, so uh, of course, I- individually, you know, lots of people, um, you know, start off as atheists, Francis Collins, the head of the National Institutes of Health and the head of the Human Genome Project before that, super smart guy, he was an atheist and became an evangelical and wrote a book about it, The Language of God. You know, so of course there's individual cases where there's none of the influences I'm talking about. They, his case, he had just a personal experience, a revelatory experience. You know, I was out on a hike on a cold day and I saw this frozen waterfall and I fell to my knees and, you know, I felt the presence of Jesus. He writes about this in this book. Okay, so there's lots of those kind of one-off events that people have. And, and then, of course, there's the always popular, you know, down on your luck. You know, life is hard. And bad things, bad things happen. I remember I met Isaac Hayes, the singer, once. He's a Scientologist, and I knew he was a Scientologist, and and I've, I've been pretty critical of Scientology. But you know, he's a was a super nice guy. It's Thanksgiving dinner at a mutual friend of ours. So I just asked him, Isaac, what you know, what what does Scientology do for you? And he said, Well, Michael, let me tell you, I you know, I had made it to the top. You know, I was rich. I was a famous you know musician, and uh, and so on. He you know he want to a, a um, you know award for his a theme from shaft his theme music from that film and big star lost it all 
you know, the typical story of, you know, drugs and, and uh, all the trappings that go with mm-hmm. being a big star. And he lost it all and Scientology helped him get his life back together. So there's a lot of those kind of stories. So and, level of loyalty to the religion that kind of got you when you were at the lowest level. Yes. And, uh, you know, to that, I say, well, good, you know, whatever it takes to get through life. I understand. I'm, I'm not a militant atheist where I think, you know, everybody always uh, must give up their religion. Some people just find it comforting and, and they're not making any empirical claims that this is true in any ontological sense. Like this is the true nature of the universe. It includes this particular God. No, they're just saying, look, uh, it just works for me. OK, it helped me. And, and I like these people. End of story. A little bit like uh, maybe if you're a Democrat or a Republican, you know, it's it, it, that that's not always a matter of who has the best arguments. In fact, research on political science and, and preferences of what people choose, it often turns around uh, what kind of people you like to be around. What are their values and which party kind of best represents those kind of people and those kind of values? Not the particular uh, planks in the platform of that uh, particular election for that party. And it's a little bit like that. And we do know from a behavior genetic studies on twins separated from birth and to what extent uh, these kinds of things are heritable, temperament, personality, that you know people migrate toward political parties and religions that make them feel good, that, that, that jives with their temperament, with their openness to experience, their conscientiousness, their, you know, introversion, extroversion, their, you know, their sense of right and wrong. And, you know, and just the kind of people that they like to be around, you know, it's, it's fun to debate people that you disagree with, but it's not fun to hang around them all the time. You know, I wouldn't want to be married to somebody who, you know, was you know, the complete opposite of me politically and religiously and so on. It would just get tiring. Right. So just kind of extrapolate that out. You know, who do you like to just hang around with? And, uh, and that that is also an influence. How about flip it? Flip it. So that's how people give their lives, how they have a spiritual moment with a God, right, with their own God, whoever that may be. Flip it to stories of people who were believers that became non-believers. What caused that event? Um, well, so there's not as much research on deconversion. There's quite a bit of research on conversion, and I've summarized some of that. Deconversion, there's not much. Uh, there's some research going on now on the nuns, the so-called people that have no religious affiliation. They tick the box for none under religious uh, in sur- surveys and polls. And, and uh, you know, it, 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 there's some uh, influence of education, for example. More educated people are slightly less religious, but not in a huge way. Like, you know, if you have a graduate degree, you're highly likely to be an atheist. No, not, not like that at all. And interestingly, the, the, in the, just the last decade, the, the percentage of nuns is, is more than doubled. It's about, about a quarter of all Americans and about a third of millennials, that is people born after 1981, uh, have no religious affiliation. They're the fastest growing religious cohort in the country, no religious affiliation. Now, my atheist friends go, aha, they're, you know, they're going to be atheists. Well, no, not necessarily. It's looking more and more like they're turning to more shall we say, secular religions, you know, Buddhism, Western Buddhism, meditation, uh, you know, the kind of people that go to Deepak Chopra Center in, in Carlsbad, or they go to Esalon Institute, where they find a lot of new age uh, spiritual beliefs that are not religiously related. And they don't believe in a personal God necessarily, but some kind of higher force or some kind of entity or something that exists beyond us. But it, it usually remains poorly defined or not defined at all. I mean, there's got to be a trend, though, because for me, I think about I was born in Iran. So war happens. I see a bunch of people die. Uh, I'm uh, uh, seeing stuff that I don't want to really see. I go to church. Every time my mom and dad take me to church, I get kicked out of Sunday school. I keep asking a one question for my Sunday school teacher that she can't answer. It's a basic question. If God so loved the world, why is why are we having so many people die because of war? Why, why did we get yeah. bombed 165 times the other day if he loves uh, uh, us so much. Why did this happen? Well, you know, and finally she calls my mom and dad and saying, your son can no longer be in Bible study because for four straight weeks, she couldn't answer one basic <laughs> question, right? So yeah. I go to Germany. I see some behavior by a Armenian pastor that completely turned me off from uh, uh, a certain way he was behaving around my family. Didn't like that. And I called him out on it. And I was a 10, 11 year old kid. He didn't like that too much, but you know, it's uh, I'm my father's son and I'm a protector. And then we come to the States go to the army. I'm still an atheist. 25 years of my life, I'm an, I'm, a, I'm an atheist, right? So then eventually I study everything, Scientology, I do whatever I can get my hands on because I'm curious. LDS, Mormonism, Joseph Smith, Jehovah, you read the books, Case for Christ, Case for Church, all these things. But I also saw a trend 
why believers became non-believers. Typically, there was a letdown by either a religious leader who set the example and he did something, you know, whether it's a behavior, normally it's a, it's a, what do you call it? A girl, a woman, you know, kid, drugs. He wants to leave the life. So you're disappointed. Oh my God, I cannot believe this pastor did this. There's no way in the world I'm going to be Catholic Christian. So you leave the life, right? Typically it's a disappointment by a father figure, somebody in the family, but there's also a heartbreak when they pray because they lose a loved one. And that absolutely crushes them, right? Where they sit there and say, look, I pray for this. You didn't answer my question. Why am I going to believe in God? Would you mind sharing the story of Maureen with the audience for them to kind of, uh, and, and tell me if that had any effects for you, because I can tell you for me, that was my biggest disappointment because I lost a loved one. What kind of an effect did that have on your faith? Yeah, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll share that story momentarily. I think you've tapped into the, a huge issue that is the what's called theodicy or the problem of evil. Why, why bad things happen to good people? Now, theists will argue, well, the examples you just gave uh, of war, that's human cause that we attribute to agency, free will, humans have free will, God gave us free will, and we made bad choices, so too bad. <laughs> that and that goes back to the fall in the garden uh when you know adam and eve and that whole story that we are by nature sinful and that's part of the sinful nature uh that uh theists uh, are willing to agree we have and and so w- things like war homicide genocide rape torture so on you know those are human caused okay so that's one thing but and that i agree with you that is problematic from a uh you know a theistic point of view, but they do have a response to that. What they don't have a good response to, in my opinion, is uh, natural evil. That is tsunamis, earthquakes, uh, childhood leukemia. I mean, just take that one, or just just take the thousands of of children that die every year from starvation. I mean, we know what they need. (laughs) And, uh, you know, the Bill Gateses of the world can only do so much. Why can't God do what Bill Gates does? I mean, why, why can't he help it, you know, this is, these are like a one-year-old. What kind of volition and agency does a one-year-old have who gets, you know, leukemia and dies a horrible, miserable life, suffering, and then the parents suffer for the rest of their lives, losing their children? And, uh, and these, in my opinion, do not have a good answer to that. So I think you've made a correct deduction there. And, and in the case you asked about Maureen was my girlfriend in, in uh, uh, at Pepperdine and, and uh, for several years after in graduate school and so on, and she got in a, a bad car accident. And broke her back and uh this was the sweetest wonderful smartest nicest woman i knew and i just could not believe that this happened and i was kind of in the transition from leaving to re- leaving my religion and becoming a non-believer but for a moment i thought you know what i'm just gonna pray for her because you know maybe there is a god what do i know and uh you know if anybody deserves to be healed it's her and i you know you talk to a million christians and you'll get a million stories of you know people that are miraculously healed you know, they prayed to God and God, you know, reached into the uh, world and, and, and performed a miracle. Why not? Why not her? Well, of course, nothing happened. And she's still paralyzed to this day. And so it's like, why that? Now, I wasn't putting God to some, you know, test. It wasn't a public thing. I didn't write about it for decades afterwards. And um, yeah, but I just thought, you know what, that's a good I don't know, one last nail in the coffin, so to speak, of the death of God for me was, you know, I, I think it's more likely that just bad things happen that they do just you know as the bumper sticker says shit happens it's the second law of thermodynamics it's entropy you know there's just more ways for things to go wrong than things to go right just think of a sand castle at the beach you know how many how many ways are there to push grains of sand together into something that looks like a castle not many compared to the near infinite ways the grains could be molded into just uh, featureless lumps and that's a metaphor for the human body just way more things to go wrong than right and and so people get cancer just randomly it's just there's no meaning behind it at all and and if there is a god and he's all good and all powerful then it's an indictment that he's not all good if, if he doesn't do anything about it so that's my take on it you know it's like anything you debate so i'm sitting there debating somebody on the topic of guns and there's no way i can win this debate i'm like why is this person debating it with me in such a strong way there's no matter what i say this this woman's not gonna and he eventually realized, you know, uh, her kid, her husband, they believed in guns. They let the gun out. The kid grabs it and shoots herself. And mm-hmm. boom. I mean, that. So no matter how, the more you debate this person on the freedoms of gun and Second Amendment, the more she's hating you, the more she's yeah. like, 
the more so there is no winning that debate, right? So for me, there's not a black and white in this when it comes down to talking because everyone's got a little bit of a different story and that's personal. The only thing you know is your life. The only thing I know is my life. The only thing we know is to get our hands and then whatever books we get our hands on, it's kind of tough to get to the truth uh, uh, on the other way around. But if you don't mind taking the argument that you made, I thought it was so profound. I wouldn't mind you unpacking that a little bit more where you said, if there's all these arguments, if there's all these uh, 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 2 billion Christians, you got 1.1 Muslims, why is it that those 1.1 Muslims believe everybody else who doesn't believe in their God is an atheist or, you know, the argument you were making? Would you mind going through that argument on why you think people, man created God rather than God created man? Yeah, sure. Uh, I'll do that in a moment. But you, you brought up a good example of guns. Guns are another religious like uh, value that people hold. It's in my opinion, because I've done a number of gun debates. I think we do need some gun control, even though I used to be against gun control as a former libertarian, now classical liberal. Uh, I, I discovered that people, um, uh, uh, that gun belief in guns is a proxy for something else, for freedom, for liberty, for the American way, for, for some deeper value. So in that extent, it doesn't matter how many people are shot every year and homicides, accidental uh, childhood, uh, you know, guns going off and things like that. It, it's irrelevant. There, there's no amount of people that could die that's going to uh, change the way they feel about guns because it's not about the guns. It's about the Second Amendment. It's about Constitution, freedom, liberty, autonomy, uh, self-defense, and, you know, these kind of deeper features. And, and, and so a lot of religious truths work that way. And so it's whenever you're talking to somebody about politics or religion, it's always good to figure out what's the deeper moral value behind the specific thing they're talking about, immigration or abortion or whatever. Because they're, you're, you're, if, they're, if they're pretty stubborn and stuck uh, on the belief that, and they're not going to change because it represents something deeper, then it, it's really a waste of time to go through like this data and statistics on gun violence or abortion rates or immigration rates or whatever. It do, doesn't matter. <laughs> and I think religions operate that way, you know, that, that this is my religion. This is what I believe. That's it. Full stop. Uh, I'm not interested in debating it. And you could go through like atheists do. They go through the all the different arguments for God and why they don't hold water. And, and therefore, it's more likely there's not a God than there is a God and so on. But that's irrelevant to somebody that believes for some other reason. You know, this gives my meaning, my life meaning or purpose. It's what my family is all about. It's all my friends and my social network are all of this religion. I see everybody every week and and we all go through the rituals together and it gives my life meaning and good, good music and the social camaraderie. Um, so the arguments that you might make, like I will in, in just a moment, uh, are really irrelevant to the believer. So now on that subject of man creating God. So here I take the approach of an anthropologist or a social psychologist of religion, which of which there are many who study this, that um, again, going through where we started with, you know, the predictors of people's religiosity. But it also depends uh, if you take it up one more scale, uh, where you happen to have been born in the world and what century you were born in or what millennium. Uh, you know, if we were born, you and I or anybody in the world, anybody born more than, uh, tw say, 2,500 years ago, at the time of the ancient Greeks, there were no Christians. You wouldn't be a Christian because Christ wasn't born yet. <laughs> Jesus wasn't born yet. There were no Christians and uh, or Mormons or Scientologists or anything else. So very much, you know, religion, very much the, the, the God you happen to believe in is very much determined by where on earth you happen to have been born by chance and what century or millennium you happen to be born. To me, that, that in conjunction with the fact that no religion has any particular purchase on truth, that is um, reliable uh, knowledge that, that I have arrived at through empiricism and reason. And these are the six reasons I, I believe X, whatever it is, and there's some way to test it. Uh, religion doesn't have anything like that. I mean, religious believers give their arguments. This is why I believe. But it isn't really why they believe. They believe for these other emotional, psychological reasons. And uh, and again, in some cases, that's okay. Like politically, uh, you know, there's there's no one right truth there. But um, But the problem arises when religions claim that they have absolute truth. So in your case, you know, in, in Iran, you know, so you have... You have religious conflicts there with no way to resolve the problem. Or if you want to just 
turn to the Israeli or Arab Israeli problem. You know, basically, you got two two guys with uh, they both have a deed to the same piece of land, and there's no escrow company to go to to resolve who actually owns it, right? Because the escrow company is God, and each of them says, "I have a direct line to God. He told me this is mine," and each of them says that, and the anthropologist from Mars goes, "Well." which one of you is right? And they each go, well, well, I'm right. And the other guy goes, I'm right. And there's no way to resolve it. There's no experiment we're going to run to go, oh, you're the right one. The other one's the wrong one. So they get the land. Historically, these things are always settled, you know, violently through through war, conflict. And, uh, but we can't do that anymore because of nuclear weapons. So, uh, so we're probably going to be stuck with this Israeli air problem, short of a two-state two solution, which is the only way I, I, I can see could ever be resolved. You know, asking somebody, you know, could we pay you for this particular piece of land? You know, it, 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 it's almost like asking somebody how much they would charge for sex or for dinner. You know, if you have friends to have you over for dinner, what can yeah. I pay you? You know, it's just that's a sacred value. You don't put money on it. And uh, so, it, you know, there's a whole suite of of uh, beliefs like this, like organ donations. You know, why not sell your organs? Well, people are very uncomfortable with this idea and same thing with prostitution. Most people are not comfortable, you know, and, and, you know, sex workers that charge for their services, you know, that used to be called prostitution, which has a negative valence to it because again, people have certain sacred value values that they'll never give up that you can't put a price on. And, uh, and there we, that, you know, that explains much of the world's conflict, I think. So man created God, not the other way around. God created. That's what it, that's what it looks like to me. I mean, you know, if you kind of lay it out, the different claims made by the different religions that are in conflict with one another, uh, and, and the and the fact that you know flood myths are common amongst religions that uh, you know were born and raised, <laughs> that is the religion on a body of water that floods, right? Or resurrection myths, you know, Christians claim our, ours is unique, you know, because we have the resurrection. No, that's not true. There's lots of religions with resurrected gods, and the theme of resurrection comes up a lot, uh, e either literally or metaphorically. And you know, almost all um, born of a virgin, you know, that this is also not unique to Christianity. There's lots and lots of examples of, of deities that are, are born of virgins. And, you know, gods having sex with humans in the in the ancient uh, uh, Greek and Roman world around the time Christianity came came online, that was very common. Gods gods routinely came down from the heavens, had sex with mostly women, <laughs> and uh, you know, then the result were the virgin births. Right? You know, this was not unusual at the time, and men could become gods or partial gods, and gods could become humans or partial humans. You know, so this whole business that uh, that critics of Christianity have about how can you believe that Jesus was with, was both God and the Son of God? How can that be? You know, there's a problem of identity. You can't be both at the same time. Well, it, it, in the Roman times, when Christianity was born, that was quite common. Gods could routinely uh, have sex and and become uh, human for a while, and then return to becoming just gods, and and go back to being human or partial human, and that that was actually a common belief. So to me, all elements of all the religions uh, are obviously socially constructed. You know, people made them, made up these stories. So so two follow up questions for uh, for that. So in in the story of Virgin Mary, right when Jesus was born, and we read the Bible. In your mind, based on the Bible that you read and you studied, did she say, I was not with anybody, I'm a virgin, I've never been with a man, and then the story came about? Meaning, what is the sequencing in your uh, ideas? Because, yes, a lot of people at that time can claim and say, look, I didn't get pregnant. I'm telling you, I didn't do it. I didn't have sex with anybody. It was a guy that came, and I'm pregnant. The question would be, what are the chances of her saying that and her son being Jesus Christ? That's a mathematical question. That's more statistically. You know, the chances of her saying, yeah, I'm telling you, I wasn't with anybody. This is God's work. Like, okay, Mary, you know, you, you're full of it. You have no idea what you're talking about. And I'm telling you, this is not me. And then boom, one point, one out of 113 billion people being born, her kid becomes Jesus. What's it? What's well, the, kid becomes, okay, the, I see these are, in my mind, two independent uh, events. They're, they're not necessarily tied together. We don't know. We don't. We you know people that study ancient Roman gods, uh, you know, can list off some of these names that are not at the top of my head. But uh, but there was another one. Um, 
uh, of, let's see, um, oh shoot, uh, of Tiana, uh, I forget his name. 2,500 now. 20, 2, years <laughs> before it happened to Jesus. There's another story like that. No, no, no. Around the same time, actually, uh, it, the same century. Um, and uh, anyway, his name is escaping me now, but, 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 uh, but there were lots of, of individuals like this who claimed that they were born of a virgin, uh, were persecuted by authorities, were put to death, were raised you know, from the dead and went to heaven and so on. The Jesus story is not the only one. So you can't put a calculation on it and then, and then combine these two in, independent events, the virgin birth and, but the and the difference is Jesus you know, story. You know one of them and you can't think of the other person's name. So but no, there's there's lots of them. There, there's well, lots what of I'm what I'm saying there. to you is no no. What I'm saying to you, I know you say there's a lots of my skeptic side. I'm more skeptic than I'm a believer. I, I'm more on the skeptical side than on the believer side. But I'm also a math guy. What is the likelihood of a person saying that and the son ends up becoming who he is and has two billion people following well, this guy? Well, again, these are independent uh, events. Jesus didn't become Jesus because uh, of, of the virgin birth or anything like that. It's because of Paul. And even there, uh, you have to really trace for about two centuries how Christianity became the, uh, the, the state religion uh, under Constantine in the fourth century. Uh, it's, no, late fourth century. And, uh, and, 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 and you only need like a one and a half, two percent uh, conversion rate or birth rate. It within a religion for it to grow from you know a few tens of people to a few tens of millions of people to a few hundred million people by the fifth century all the way up till today to two billion people that's like compound interest so it doesn't take a miracle to explain the growth of religion same you thing you can't uh, say that you can't say same, that. same thing but the argument you're making could be made for islam is just yeah, as but well. you, but what you are the chances that. that muhammad in the seventh century yeah and his particular unique story would end up it, you know, in the 21st century with a billion and a half followers. No, no, but that's not what I'm saying. No, no, that's not what I'm, no, no, but there's two, by the way, if you want to do that math, then we have to go back to Hindu, which I think is 2300 BC. And then uh, Buddhism, that's 2500 BC. How come they're both smaller than Muslim and Christianity? Then the debate becomes, well, then if that's the case, Muslim is creating more momentum than any other religion in the world. So we can have that discussion. I've done that as well, because yeah. That, yeah. that's completely separate. Where I'm going with you is the following. I'm going to, a guy gets up. And he says, here's who I am. This is what's going to happen. A woman is pregnant. She says, I'm telling you, I didn't hook up with anybody. I'm like, what are you talking about? Of course, you're going to claim something like that. You're out of your mind. I'm telling you, this is not, I didn't do anything. I'm a virgin, whatever. I don't know what's going on. This could be something special here. Years later, we find out it's Jesus. And the chances of that to be 2 billion people, you can't say, well, it's that easy. Any religion could do it as long as they grow 1.5% of we 10 million. Well, but that's the hindsight bias. You're taking the one that that, that won out and ignoring all the other ones that uh, that didn't become major. All religions. I'm saying is the, the, it's, it's the chances of a virgin mother, and she makes the claim, then the son becomes who she said he was going to become. That's a very, that's a very... Uh, uh, it's a little bit spooky, if I can use the word, because even as a skeptic myself, you sit there and say, what are the chances of that? So I'm not going to what Prophet Muhammad said. I'm not going to what anybody else. And I'm specifically using that situation. We don't have any other story like that that got as big as this one did. Well, but again, you're, you're, you're picking out the, so the, the hindsight bias. You're picking out the one that happened to uh, be successful. You have to look at all the ones that have the same story that didn't become successful. Why didn't they? So, so maybe so that's a question for you though, not for me. Here it is. I, I, I found it. I was yeah. looking at my slides here. Apollonius of Tyana. He's a first century AD living in Asia Minor. His followers claimed he was the son of God, that he was able to walk through closed doors, heal the sick, cast out demons, and raise a dead girl back to life. He was accused of witchcraft, sent to Rome before the court, was jailed, but escaped. After he died, his followers claimed he appeared to them and then ascended to heaven. So uh, now this is around the same time as Jesus, and Jesus didn't become a big thing until, again, centuries later. You know, the Gospels themselves were not even written, or the earliest one, Mark, was 40 years after Jesus' death. The others, 50, 60, 70, 90 years. And, uh, and I'll just give you some other examples here. Virgin birth myths. Um, uh, these these are de deities who were born of a virgin, Dionysus, Perseus, Buddha, Atis, Krishna, Horus, Mercury, Romulus, and Jesus. Dionysus is the ancient Greek god said to have been born from a virgin woman. 
fathered by the king of heaven, to have transformed water into wine, introduced the idea of eating and drinking the flesh and blood of God, was the liberator of his people, and to have returned from the dead. Uh, resurrection myths. The Egyptian god of life, death, and fertility was Osiris. So this is 2400 BCE that appears in the first pyramid text. He was he was considered to be the giver of life in this world, the redeemer and merciful judge of the dead in the next world. Egyptian kings believed that as Osiris rose from the dead, so would they in union with him, inheriting eternal life. And by the new kingdom, everyone believed that if they accepted Osiris as their god, they too would be resurrected. Which one of them has two million, two billion people? That well, are- so there you're making an argument for, uh, you know, po- populist argument that, you know, whoever whoever has the most adherence is more likely to be right. So Christianity about one and a half times more likely than Islam. No, uh, no I simply and- give it a point. I, I, no, no, I simply get, are you a sports guy or no? Are you a person? That oh, would- I'm, a, I'm a big sports guy. Okay, which one? P- tell me which sport. Oh, I I follow the you know NFL and NBA and, all this. Okay, good. So let's do, so so let's do NBA. Okay, let's do NBA. Who's the greatest basketball player of all time? <laughs> well, it's got to be Kareem. You go. So you say Kareem? Okay, or, good. Or, uh, but I'll go with Michael Jordan too. Okay, but I think you you make it interesting if you keep it Kareem, right? Okay, give, Kareem. Yeah. Give me your top five. So so let's just say Kareem and Michael are top two. Who's the yeah. other three? Who's the well, other? Well, well, if we're going with pre uh, current players because lebron obviously has to be on the list okay let's put lebron there as well so you got two uh, okay lebron on. yeah okay so I, and i guess i would put uh, magic johnson okay oh, why? Uh, magic. you know great player and also char- charismatic and and you know change the game yep um and uh probably larry bird just to throw in you know one white guy <laughs> <laughs> well it's good to know you don't discriminate i respect right. so so now, so now let's go with that now you said kareem tell me why kareem because i think kareem is a very easy argument as the greatest of all time, but what's your argument for Kareem being the greatest of all time? Well, because the top top scorer of all time, and also okay. number of championships, and and you know a, a, a true motivated leader of his teams. And he dominated game, you know, college, NBA, yeah. you know, revolutionary type of a player. He couldn't Consist- be stopped. consistent. Yeah, consistent number of MVPs, number yeah. of MVPs, things that he did. Okay, so all I'm saying to you is, I'm not saying that single event is the reason why. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar is a great, you know how they say Michael Jordan's the greatest of all time because he went to six championships and he never lost one. I think that's one point, but I don't think that alone is enough of a catalog to call him the greatest of all time, right? So well, LeBron's been to more championships and you have to go to Bill Russell. But to say that your mother was a virgin and you were born and you got 2 billion followers, I think that gets a point. I don't know if that says you are the greatest of all yeah, time. I, 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 get I, I see. I see where you're going with this. Yeah. No, I, I'm. I'm afraid I can't agree with that because I just. You don't, don't have I, to agree with I, that. I, I think, <laughs> point. We just got to give a point there. <laughs> I think they're independent variables there. Anyway. Right. Go ahead. So, so now let me give you the point for the opposite side. Here's a point for for the opposite side. Uh, 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 and I'm going to give you a soft one here. You know, just see what you're going to say about this. So, so many people that are educated that have degrees, smart folks. You, you mentioned Paul earlier. Oh, Jesus became big because of Apostle Paul. He was a pretty big skeptic and he was Saul before he was Paul, right? So he's a, he, he wasn't just a lightweight guy and he was a true believer later on without him. You know, him and Billy Graham probably compete for who baptized the most people. Some say Billy, some say him. It is what it is. What do you say to those who say, Michael, Super educated people like C.S. Lewis, who wrote Mere Christianity, Oxford University professor. The guy didn't believe in anything. He wrote the Chronicles of Narnia. Then he flips and he becomes one of the biggest you know, believers of the, the religion of Christianity to the point where any church that baptizes and brings new members on, the first book they read of Cost of Discipleship, the second book they read is Mere Christianity. Why is an educated man like you know, C.S. Lewis, later on in life that you're supposed to get smarter. The smarter he got, the more he flipped. Why? And you studied C.S. Lewis. Why yes, you- yes, yes. Well, again, these are in, in, in individual cases. Everyone's different. I mentioned um, uh, earlier the language of God, Francis Collins story. And uh, yeah, C.S. Lewis is similar. In, in fact, Francis Collins cites C.S. Lewis as an example because he was obviously such a smart guy. Frankly, amongst the theologians, that is really serious, super professional theologians that, you know, they don't think C.S. Lewis is all that serious as a theologian, even though they share their beliefs. Not that I'm uh, able to make that assessment, but uh, just for what that's worth. Okay, why? I don't know. You know, he um, he wrote a beautiful book called The Grief Observed about his wife who died of cancer. Again, yep. 
you know, he grapples with the problem of evil, the Odyssey. Did you ever see the movie? Did you see? Oh, Shadow yeah. Oh, yeah. Great of course. Yeah, yeah. 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 Joy was yeah. her name, right? Joy something. I think. Joy. It was Joy. Yeah, it was Joy. Yeah, Joy yeah. died from cancer and it really questioned his faith. <laughs> right. Yes. No, no. It's an incredible. So I think Anthony Hopkins plays C.S. Lewis. He, and, killed, uh, he crushed it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. He's... And uh, Deborah Winger plays Joy. It's it's yep. a, it's a it's a great film. Yep. Yeah. So there again, you know, I don't fault anybody for, you know, wanting or needing or desiring religion or uh, claiming it on some level. For what it's worth, one of the leader top uh, modern skeptics, Martin Gardner, he was one of the founders of the modern skeptic movement, longtime monthly columnist before me at Scientific American, wrote many books about uh, arguments for and against God. And he himself said, well, I think atheists have better arguments than the theists do for God's existence, but I believe in God. And it was like, what? <laughs> and he called himself a, a, a fideist or a pragmatist. Fideist is the correct term, but for, for pragmatist, that is, there are pragmatic reasons for believing in God that have to do with emotion, uh, emotional need and, and meaningfulness, purposefulness in life. And since you can't prove there is no God and it's one of a handful of Mysterian mysteries, as they're called, like free will and determinism. You know, scientists tell us that the that universe is determined from whence comes volition or free will. Well, I, 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 I feel free. So I, I'm, I, I think of it as a useful fiction, you know, and maybe God is like that for some people. And I, and I think some, I think it's something like that for C.S. Lewis, although I, I don't recall exactly. Uh, it's been so long since I studied him that that what his uh, reasoning was personally, everyone has a personal story. And uh, so I, I think probably it was something along those lines. Got it. Uh, you know, uh, in, in regards to, um, in regards to, uh, uh, religion, like, you know, years ago for me, I was sitting there debating with somebody at Rafi's place and this lady and her husband were telling me, you know, uh, uh, this is the word of God. This is the truth. You know, this is, uh, uh, you know, a hundred percent the truth. I sat there and I said, so let me, let me get this straight. So you got the Bible from day one till today. How many times has it been cut? You know, how many different versions have we had? How many different translations that we have? How many different times has it been said? you know, rewritten different languages, do you not lose some meaning to it until it becomes uh, 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 English, right? The, right. The, and that's a, the skeptic's uh, point of view. You expect yes. to believe this, right? How is this even possible for this to stay exactly what was said at that time? Well, you know, this is the word of God. But the part I would go with you is a little bit different than that one. Do you think religion was in a way used at that time to try to control uh, the naive populace where it was easier to do then than it is today? Well, um, okay, there's <laughs> there's many different theories to explain, um, you know, the origins of religion. This is one of them, you know, the kind of control, uh, uh, population control of people, sort of enforce or reinforce um, uh, moral values and, and uh, norms of the society. It's a way of saying, look, even if, you know, you think you got away with it uh, from our, our police force or whatever, you know, there's an eye in the sky that sees everything. So that's one element of religion. Uh, the other is more social capital. That is to say, it's a way, it, you know, if you particularly like just think of the founding fathers of the United States, and they argued that uh, for a, a, a self-governing people, a self-governing society to operate, people need an internal governor. Uh, and they need some kind of uh, value, moral value system. And religion is one of those. Now, the founding fathers were mostly deists, so they made an argument from Aristotle's virtue ethics. That is, there's value in, in developing virtuous characteristics in your children and in yourself, and then we'll have a society of virtuous people, and therefore you don't need so much government or religion. Uh, but, but, of course, that's pretty late in the game. Uh, both religion and governments came about around the same time, around the Axial Age, maybe five, six thousand years ago, when these, you know, kind of chiefdoms, bands, tribes and chiefdoms began to coalesce into larger states and empires. You needed a way of resolving social conflict. So you have a set of rules and laws. You got to have a police force and a court system, some kind of judicial system. The state has to be able to impose punishments or else what's the point of having rules because people will violate them and, and, and religion at the same time. You know, if you have just 10 people or 50 people living in a, a small community, you can all just meet, you know, every Friday in the commons and, and talk about your problems. But if you have millions of people, you can't do that. You need some kind of social institutions to do that. So religion is one of those. 
So that's the kind of general explanation that historians and, and sociologists of religion offer. This is a, a vital role of religion uh, is to kind of hold people together. And now in the modern world, let's say in post-World War II Europe, you, where you've seen this massive decline of religiosity, uh, almost flipped in, the, in a matter of decades uh, from almost everybody believing to, you know, only a small percentage of true believers and churches falling into, into disuse. Uh, a lot of them are empty. These ma major cathedrals are more like uh, art, art museums now. And, uh, you know, and, and, and like even in Germany, where my wife is from, you know, the Catholic Church is just bleeding members, particularly after the whole pedophile thing. You know, people are just just had enough. And uh, but see, European societies are different. They have a, a, than America. They have a much tighter social safety net because one of the rule, roles of religion over the centuries has been to take care of the poor. Which before the before capitalism and the industrial revolution, almost everybody was poor. You know, ninety percent of the world was poor, right? So this is one of the major roles of religion. But in the twentieth century, um, most governments today, including the United States, uh, have a about a, a about a quarter, about twenty percent of their GDP is allocated toward uh, social services, you know, welfare, social security, you know, food stamps, aid for poor families, and so forth. Uh, that's actually pretty common, even though you'll hear conservatives uh, complain bitterly about the numbers too high or liberals complaining that the number is too low. It's about the same as most European countries. Uh, uh, the social safety net is kind of taken over the role of religion, which leaves America as something of an outlier. How come religion hasn't declined as much or as rapidly in America as in European countries? And, and one answer is because we have the First Amendment that forbids the, relig uh, the government, the state, from getting involved in religion. So religions have undertaken to become pretty expert at marketing their products and services. They're really good at it. If you've ever been to a megachurch, uh, uh, which I have several times, it's quite the show. It, it's, I mean, they're offering a lot to their people. I mean, it is really fun to go to. It's you know, music and free parking <laughs> and lots of community and, and uh, you know, and, and people like that. And so it's not just, I need somebody to tell me what's right or wrong or the meaning of life or whatever. There's a lot more to it than that socially. Let me, let me uh, uh, ask this other question for you to uh, uh, see. You think the a country based on a Christian religion or uh, a peaceful religion does better than a country that doesn't have a religion? Uh, well, this, yeah, there's, there are studies on this that uh, the more uh, religious a nation or society, um, the less healthy the society is. Now, how is health measured? Quantitatively, what we're talking about here are things like um, abortion rates, teen pregnancy rates, STD rates, homicide rates, suicide rates, um, you know, uh, the, you know, like infant mortality. There's about 15 of these different characteristics. And a, a social scientist named Gregory Paul did this massive correlational study of like the top 20 uh, industrial democracies in the world as measured and then measured by their uh, religiosity as measured by, you know, what percentage of the population says they believe in God, they attend uh, church services, you know, every week, they read the Bible every day and so forth. And, you know, ba basically it's an inverse correlation. The, the, the higher the religiosity, the lower the rates of these um, uh, social health measures. That is to say, like in America is a standout. You know, we have the world's highest among these 20 uh, democracies. You know, we're the most religious, but we have the highest rates of homicides, highest rates of suicides, highest rates of STDs, uh, pregnancies, unwanted pregnancies, uh, abortions, you know, t uh, teen uh, problems, uh, uh, infant mortality, and so on. Now, each of these, I have to say parenthetically, each of these has an in independent uh, series of causes that have nothing to do with religion. But my point is that if religion is such a great prophylactic against social ills, that if, if a society needs it to be a healthy, happy society, how come it's the opposite in America? We're the most religious and we have the most social problems of any of these uh, countries on those measures. And so to me, it's like it's whatever religion's doing, it's not doing that. It's not helping. So you think a country is better off without a, without a religion? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yes. Really? Yeah. So yeah, as long, yeah, as long as they have, of course, you got to have some kind of social safety net. You got to have a set of standards and, and values that people go on. So my Christian friends say, yeah, even if every no one believed in God in America, we yeah. were still a, a Judeo Christian society from historically. Okay, that's true. So so then you would much rather trust in a man's values and principles that dictate the country than a 
set of principles based on a book or a Bible. You'd much rather have a man lead oh, your yeah. country, really. Oh, yeah, because let's think about the Constitution yeah. and the Enlightenment values. This, this whole centuries-long experiment has been one of, of saying, regardless of whatever your religion is, these are the values we hold, that, we, that people are, are born equal, that is of equal value, and should be treated equally under the law. And we're going to abolish slavery and torture and civil rights and women's rights and gay rights and all the things you know, we've kind of experienced in our own lifetime. These came about because of this central principle of interchangeable perspectives. There's nothing special about me or my religion or my race that, that makes me better than you and your religion and your race we, uh, are, are equal uh, is, is in terms of value. So that is an enlightenment principle. No religion came up with that. And in fact, religion has come up with quite the opposite, <laughs> you know, that our religion is the one true religion. And back to where you were talking about earlier in the conversation, you know, all these wars, the ones you personal experience growing up, that's because of religions conflict with each other and no means. To I think it's the complete opposite, though. I think it's the complete opposite. I think what you're saying is, you know, what America was founded on the Constitution, you know where they got it from. You know where they got it from. Well, OK, uh, you're going to say they got it from the Bible. But no, actually, the founding fathers were mostly deists. Uh, Jefferson, I'm Hamilton. And so no, on no, I, I'm not going to say the Bible, but do you know where they got it from? OK, go ahead. I'm curious. I'm asking you, but what do you think they got it from? What's the history? So the Constitution, did they come up with these oh, ideas? Did they well, get it from well, we, we know where they got it from. They, that... they, they, they told us. All of them were classically trained. So they knew history. They knew Greek and they knew the history of Greece and particularly Rome. So if you read the Federalist Papers, for example, there is just example after example be, between Hamilton and Madison of uh, examples from ancient Greece and Rome. Yep. And they knew these histories. And then, of course, they're, they're products of the Enlightenment. They were in the Enlightenment. You know, so, you know, John Locke and, and, and um, John Jacques Rousseau and Thomas Hobbes and all the thinkers that kind of uh, particularly Locke that, that led to this division of of uh, separation of powers because and, and if you read the federalist papers they're very much steeped in human nature they start off going look what are people like people are selfish they are power hungry if you let them they will take more than they need do you and believe they, that oh yeah totally absolutely so if you believe that if you believe that how would you trust more of a man coming up his values and principles to run your country than a higher power that you can't change it because the higher, and, and I'm well, still purely well, talking to you from a logical standpoint. <laughs> yeah. Because how, you're how do you, power, how do you, you know what okay, happens. But the problem is, how do you know what the higher power thinks? I, I, here, here's a part of me. Uh, there's a part of me that actually doesn't care. There's a part of me that cares. Well, but you have actually, to care because I'm going to ask you, well, where'd you get that particular idea? But, you got to say, well, it out. comes from the Bible. Or well, here's why. Let me explain to you why. Let me explain to you. Why. So uh, how sure are you about your beliefs? About what? About the fact that you think a man created God, not the other way around. I'm reasonably confident. It's sort of a Bayesian, say, I'd say 80 to 90 percent. OK, great. You think there's people on the opposite side that are also at 80 or 90 percent? I'd say there's religious people that are 100 percent. Yeah, I would say atheists <laughs> that think they're 100 percent, which to me, the atheist argument is the most. Well, no, 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 because... no. no. So the atheist is just a lack of belief in God. It doesn't mean okay, the strong atheist that says, I know there is no God is not a tenable position. You don't know there is no God. All we can do is put a probable. That's right. Uh, We're on the uh, same page there. Yeah. 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 So agnostic, agnostic to me is the one that says, you know, they they don't know. Right. But atheist says, I know there is no God. Well, the weak. OK, there's there's strong atheist that says, I know there is no God. That's not a tenable position, in my opinion. The weak atheist just says, I just don't believe in God. Uh, now, there might be. And if it, I could change my mind or you know, I might find out later. But OK, for now, I, I, I just assume there isn't unless proven otherwise. OK, but that doesn't tell you anything about what somebody believes. You know, and say, well, what do you believe in? Well, I believe in civil rights and civil liberties, and I yeah. believe in love and sure. you know, whatever. That, sure. that has nothing to do with atheism. It's completely but there's atheism. but there's one thing, a religion that's a hundred percent proven. That's proven it's a hundred percent right. You know what religion that is? Hmm. The religion of I don't know. The religion of okay, all right. Yes uh, or no. I mean, that's yeah, that's hundred yeah. percent proven. So meaning <laughs> meaning you can say you believe in Jesus. He can say he believes in Prophet Muhammad. She can say she believes in whoever. I can say, guys, listen, we can sit here and fight all we want and put events together in halls and gather a thousand people and sell a hundred dollar tickets. And you and I can debate all day long. And the answer at the end of the day is what? Neither one of us know. Right. Yeah, right. OK, so if we know 
we know that's the only 100% is that we don't know. Let's set that aside. If we know we're going off of, you're never going to be 100% right. I'm never going to be 100% right till we die. We're not going to know, right? So as long as we're living and we have the religion of I don't know, what do we want to base the country off of? Let's pick a manual. This manual called Bible Works. We have the Bible. What's the book that L. Ron Hubbard wrote? Dianetics. We have uh, the Quran. We have the book of Moroni, whichever book you want to pick. We have, pick any of the books. We have Buddhism, you know, great book. I've read it. It's very, to me, it's, it's, a, it's, if I wasn't a Christian, I'd probably be a Buddhist. You know, let's take all these books. Let's take uh, Meditations by, uh, what do you call it? By uh, our friend, uh, the Stoic, Sister. Marcus Aurelius, right? Marcus, Marcus Aurelius. That's oh, no, that's right. Marcus Aurelius. Let's, yeah. let's pick one of these books, Michael, and let's build the foundation of the country of this one person. And let's not even look at it as a God. Let's look at it as a philosopher and a way of living. Don't you think it's better to pick a book of a person that's not alive to go live life off of that than a person that's alive that can all of a sudden have a meltdown and change and become a dictator? No. The, 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 correct, the correct answer is you don't base a, uh, you don't base a constitution on oh any book. No, book. no book. The whole point of the U.S. Constitution, what makes it unique amongst yeah. all political systems ever invented, yep. is that it's not based on any book. It's based on a set of principles derived through reason and then open to change. You know, as as Madison said, ambition must be made to counteract ambition. People have their preferences. The Jew, the Christian, the Muslim, they each want as much power as they can get. So we have to have a rule in there that says nobody gets to have any state sanctioned religion. There are no religions state sanctioned by the state. Full stop. You can believe whatever you want, but it can't influence our political system. Done. Okay. next. You know, well, I, you know, that, that my race should be the superior race. Okay, well, we kind of messed that up in the, with the slavery thing. But, but, you know, we got that eventually solved through a civil war and so on. So, but, but, so the whole principle is based on ideas, not people's books, not holy books, not revelation. You know, you can't, if you were to write a new constitution today, you wouldn't start off saying, well, we begin with that Jesus is our savior. No. And died for our sins because Jews and Muslims would go, hey, 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 we, yeah. we live here too. But America was founded based on Judeo-Christian values and principles. You know that. Roughly, I mean, roughly speaking. But a not minus, really. minus, minus Thomas Jefferson being a side, uh, you well, know. But, 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 if you uh, read, but again, read Hamilton and Madison, read the Federalist Papers. There's no God in there. There's no Bible. There's no religion. These are all just ideas. So so was there, was there God for George Washington? Was there God for... Uh, was Washington, a Washington was a he was a deist, but more of a believer than Jefferson. Yeah, he was. Jefferson, yeah, Jefferson but, was definitely not. But, but 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 it doesn't matter what the founders believed. It doesn't matter. It, it's the ideas I that they came up. I totally agree. With. Yeah, oh, I yeah. totally agree. But like you know, uh, uh, kids going to school. Would I want the kids go to a school that are based on a certain values and principle that's a higher power than a man? I don't know if, if I'm from my record, anybody you've given too much power to, you've heard the quote before power, you know, corrupts people in absolute power. Right. I don't need to repeat that. You've heard that a million times. I'm so, just a little too yeah. concerned about giving men a little bit too much power. Absolutely. Again, ambition must be made. To maybe maybe you like that. Maybe you like that. Maybe you married a German and she rubbed off on you. I don't know. Maybe <laughs> you kind of like a man having too much. Yeah. Power. yeah. <laughs> okay. Right. My inner Nietzsche. <laughs> Your inner Nietzsche. Yes. Let, let's talk about some other topics. We can get off of religion here. By the way, do you, what's more important, a better debate or better debater? Well, the better debate is the is the key you think I, so? it's ideas ideas is i'm interested right. in ideas i don't care whether i win a debate or not it's irrelevant you, but you know you know how sometimes you got a better debater with bad ideas ends up crushing somebody with a better debate uh, well see that's the terrible. problem I, I for example christopher hitchens and i were you know pr pr pretty simpatico on most things but i wouldn't want to debate him on, on even something <laughs> i knew way more than him about because <laughs> if he just took the other side i know i'd lose <laughs> by the way one of my one of my favorite guys to watch when there's a debate, it's him. Have you seen him and his brother? Oh, I've, I've seen, watched all his videos. It's yeah, ridiculous. I, I knew Hitch. He was a friend of mine. Yeah, yeah. I knew him. And my, my dog's name is Hitch. You know, there's <laughs> something about him that feels very likable and warm. I don't know. He's a likable. He's a likable guy. Something like about him guy. that felt, uh, yeah. I don't Same have things. to agree with the guy, but I liked him. So is Dawkins, and so is Sam Harris. Everybody thinks these, you know, they, they're, they're, these atheists are militant and and so on. They're, no, they're not. They're actually nice guys. I actually think they're necessary because they can uh, point out the weakness and the opposing argument, and sometimes strengthen it. Well, uh, that's the point of debate: is if if you can't articulate the other side, 
at yeah. your positions, then you don't really know your own position. No question about it. No question about it. Uh, final thoughts on a conspiracy theory. So okay. which conspiracy theory gave you the most uh, 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 hard time debunking where you're kind of like, oh, my. I mean, I've heard your 9-11. I've heard your uh, John F. Kennedy. I've heard the. I've heard. I've heard a lot of your debates, and you're just like, nope. This is what happened. Nope. This is nope. 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 But which one is it? Where you're like, I don't know. There's something there. Well, at the moment, the one we're going through it right now is the lab leak hypothesis for COVID. Uh, that that door is not shut. We don't know. That could still be a kind of conspiracy. Even if it's an accident. Uh, probably not intention, probably not a bioweapon development, uh, but a gain of function for other reasons, maybe research that leaked. But whatever it is, you know, and then the, the Chinese are hiding it. You know, that's a kind of conspiracy uh, of which there's a, a theory about it. And I, I'm, I'm troubled that the fact that in early 2020, say March, April, that was a viable uh, conspiracy theory to discuss. And then all of a sudden it wasn't acceptable to even talk about it anymore. It was considered fake news. Uh, and uh, now all of a sudden it's okay again because John Stewart went on a comedy show and talked about, you know, it's like, how is it that a comedian can tell our society what's acceptable for debate? Come on. All right. So, um, well, then a few other, well, of course, I, I was uh, about the Jeffrey Epstein death at first. I thought, nah, no conspiracy. And then, you know, and then when the news came out about the second camera that broke down, I thought, okay, come on, chances of that are fairly low. So my my priors were changed. My Bayesian reasoning went up that, you know, you know, change, change my priors to the probabilities being higher that it, it was murdered. But then I got an email and I posted this on Twitter and then I got an email from somebody saying, I worked at that prison. Those cameras never worked. It's a piece of shit <laughs> prison. Nothing worked in there. I'm like, oh, OK, never mind. I think they just closed down the prison, though. Did they not? Like they just either closed I, it I think I there. think so. Yeah, yeah I think they, they lost their funding. I don't know what. Anyway, uh, but but I just finished my next big book on conspiracy theory. So I actually have several chapters on real ones. You know, uh, all the stuff that um, between the Pentagon Papers and WikiLeaks, uh, you know, Edward Snowden's, Snowden's stuff uh, about what our government was doing, you know, why, uh, you know, warrantless wiretaps and surveillance programs, not just under Bush, but under Obama, you know, Mr. President Transparency. You know, there was a lot of shenanigans going on there. And then the stuff that came out about... Um, Abu Ghraib and, you know, torture. And, you know, we still have captured 9-11 terrorists in Guantanamo Bay just sitting there 20 years later, and they still haven't had a trial. That's totally against not only our own judicial system, but the Geneva Convention about war crimes and how war uh, prisoners of war are to be treated. I mean, it's just staggering, the stuff that's coming out. And now there's new stuff about uh, just coming out like this week, hopefully, about uh, the role of the Saudi government and, and the Saudi royal family and so on, funding uh, the 9-11 terrorists, you know, that we then support their regime. They're our allies. Hang on for a second. And this gets back to the, you know, Michael Moore's crazy. Uh, no, not Michael Moore. Sorry. It was, I think it was, no, that, that wasn't Michael Moore. It is Michael. Alex Jones conspiracy, you know, about, you know, all the um, uh, Saudis who left not, uh, America on 912, you know, the, the, the U S government said, okay, you can leave, but all flights were shut down. How did they leave? Okay. What is the story there? Come on. You know, so forget the 9-11 truthers and their inside job that Bush did it. He, he, he couldn't he couldn't figure out how to do any of that. <laughs> you know, uh, the real story is probably this other conspiracy, not to mention the two trillion dollars we spent just in Afghanistan, six trillion total uh, on both wars and the whole homeland security and the surveillance state, and all the loss of civil liberties because of that. All these things, that's the, that's the true conspiracy, right? So don't get uh, sidetracked by these 9-11 truthers. They're a distraction from the real stuff that's going on. Even now, here huh. we are, you know, second week in, in, in September of 2021, there's still stuff that happened we don't know. And I think that's there's something there. 9-11 truthers are the real conspiracy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're the just no, they're the distraction. They're, they're the ones from that are the real from everybody. the real conspiracy. Yeah. Yeah. What 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 concerns you more? What concerns you more, Michael? Bio warfare, cyber warfare, you know, or you know, what you hear about the uh, you know, we were talking to my uh, Eric here, uh, who you know, some are talking about weather to be able to manipulate weather. You know, that's been around for a while. They've been talking about that yeah. for a while. I talked to a 
uh, inventor who said it's very easy to manipulate weather if you want to add larger scales, a different story. What concerns you the most? You, so you look like somebody that would read these weird books and study I these. I, I, I read all those weird books. That's my, my job, is studying weird things. <laughs> now, the, 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 the only real existential threat that I see is nuclear weapons. You know, there's still over 10,000, uh, which is enough to eradicate the species. Uh, there's nothing even remotely like that. I don't think climate change is an existential threat. I don't think terrorism is an existential threat. But nuclear weapons are. We'd have to get it down below 1,000 nuclear weapons to prevent like a nuclear winter or something like that, that that could be catastrophic even if it didn't kill every last human it would you know cause so such massive suffering that it that's a concern you put, and, I don't, and you, i don't know a way around it because of the let's call the security dilemma or the hubbesian trap or the other guy problem you know i want to get rid of my nukes but the other guy's got them you know so it, we can't we can't you know like with north korea we can't we can't let up and that's always going to be a problem yeah, there's not a solution there. And, and even if let's just say they say, oh, we got rid of everything. Do you believe them? No. <laughs> so so how do you how do you figure that part out? Yeah, anyway, all right. I, I've thank enjoyed you. having you on. Uh, no, you. you know, we're going to put the link to your books below. And thank you. Uh, thank you for taking the time. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. This was quite the conversation. I had no idea what we were going to talk about. So I enjoyed uh, this, it. this worked out great. Thank you. <laughs> Anytime. Take care. Bye bye. OK, bye bye. So I'm curious, did man create God or did God create man? Comment below. I'm curious from today's interview. If you like this interview, i got two other interviews for you. One of them is when I sat down with uh, Deepak Chopra and Carlsbad. We had a great conversation together. And the other one is a sit down I had with Dennis Prager, one of my favorite people in the world to listen to. Click over here. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.